Good afternoon, everyone. So I'll presume that you don't know about my company, and I'll presume. Okay. So assume that you are working in an ERSS team or in police. ERSS means emergency response support system. For example, you hear about an accident. So what you're supposed to do? Call an. You, you are you are the ERSS. You are the police. You are the police team. You get a call and you hear about an accident. What you people do? What you're supposed to do? Exactly, reach this spot. In cities like Chennai, there are a lot of traffics. And because of that, the police team as well as the emergency response team, definitely it will take some time to reach. Right? So there is a big gap in addressing that particular victims. So in Arkin Labs, we are developing a solution to address that particular gap. Not only that, once we develop our solution, this application can be suited to different verticals and we can address different problems. Right. So our main uh, focus is on formulating drones as a solution. We are not just a drone company. We are formulating drones as a solution. So based on drone, we are going to provide a solution. So myself, Ramesh Kumar and uh, my partner is Abhishek, uh, who co-founded uh, this startup. And what we are doing is we are developing a cloud-based platform wherein any authorized person can manage a drone from anywhere, literally from anywhere. You don't have to be in the vicinity of the drone or in the vicinity of the accident spot to deploy the drone. Right. So the main problem which we focus here is, for example, if you are a police, you want to use a drone for uh, surveillance, do the surveillance of that particular accident spot. What you're supposed to do? You need to call an operator, drone operator, you need to uh, uh, lend them the drone and the drone has to be uh, taken to the uh, nearest uh, area and then the guy will set up the drone and then fly it. By the time the ambulance would have reached the spot. Right. So this is the problem we have. So drones are promising solution, but the existing solutions is not that much promising to address this particular problem. So what we are actually doing is we are building a network of, we are building a solution which have a network of drones connected together and all these drones are placed in a docking station in important hotspots of the city and we are connecting all the drones over cellular network, 5G cellular network. So a central command station will be there. This control center will receive a call when police or ERSS will receive same same time. So this system is going to decide which drone is nearest to the accident spot and the drone will automatically takes off and reaches the spot and give surveillance. This is our first objective. Once we establish this one, these drones can be equipped with the required medicines, the basic medicines which can uh, treat the victims at the spot. So this is what our ultimate solution. So. For this one, we need to build a lot of docking stations across the cities and we need to place the drones. So the advantage of this one is, uh, it is the drones are available on demand, right? The drones are available on demand and these are, these are the competitive advantages, quick response time. You don't have, you don't spend much time on setting up the drone and flying the drone. Anytime the drone will be available, you just get a call, the system will get notified and drone automatically takes off and goes to the location. So you are reducing time, the drone is, a, 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 the drone is available on the demand and beyond visual line of sight. And the important tec technical thing which we focus here is on beyond visual line of sight. Right. So if the accidents happen in Tinagar, you cannot fly a drone sitting here in the current technology. So what we are doing is we are connecting all the drones with the cellular network over the cellular network and using a mobile app or using a cloud dashboard you can sit in a system and you can uh, use the cloud dashboard to monitor and fly all the drones in real time. You can, you can also fly the drone in real time. That is the advantage of our system. So we do also real time video analytics not just getting video surveillance. There are some applications which require video surveillance. For example the police started using drones for uh, crowd monitoring in, in, in uh, important days, right? So there you require video analytics too, how many people are going, right? What objects are there? Even in case of accidents, we can determine whether blood loss is there, whether any fuel leakage is there, uh, how much how much severe the damage is, everything can be done. So real time video cloud analytics is there, right? It is happening on the uh, cloud, not on the drone itself, right? And immediate backup availability, as I said, there are network of drones available. Even if one drone is going to fail, the other drone is going to take off, is going to do the mission. So there is no downtime, there is no uh, failure in operating drones. So these are our 
competitive advantage uh, advantage which other competitor is not having as of now so who are your competitors in this uh Garuda Aerospace is there. They are also there is one of the competitor. Ara One Man Systems are there. They are also do. But these people are individually operating drones, and they are primarily focusing on data analytics, Correct. not on operation of the drone, other things. But we are focusing on this cloud-based platform, which none of the competitors are having. So basically, you are complementing them. Yes, exactly. We can be a service provider to Garuda Aerospace or Ara One Man Systems. Those people. Understood. But we can also directly go into the market. We once we do our own drone manufacturing. So this is our business model. Ultimately, our customers are going to be the law enforcement people, uh, the other people. As I said, once the network is created, we can cater to different applications. This business model is for the first responders and the law enforcement people. So we are creating the business models for other applications. For example, serving encroachment. In, in city, you could see there are a lot of encroachments over the years. So once we do this kind of network of drones, every time, every month or every Time, particular time duration, we can fly the drone and we can uh, monitor the city and we can um, have the encroachment status. So, this is one application. Like this, we are uh, focusing on different uh, sectors. So, our revenue model is going to be subscription model, wherein uh, you buy dr drone from us and you need to pay the subscription every month to use our cl cl cloud platform. Uh, but you just now said you are going as a DAS. Drone as a service. Exactly. Like Garuda has a drone and you are providing, it's something where you are complementing. Exactly. So why do we have to buy a drone from you? It's only the services that uh, you The drones, buy. as of now, we are focusing on a platform which can cater to the drone which only produce by us. So then you are not complementing the other drone? That's what. Our current focus is on operating with our drones alone. So are you, In manufacturing, future, are you manufacturing your Right now drones? we are not manufacturing because other competitors are doing uh, drones. It is easy to get from them. But right now, we are going to focus on our cloud platform. That is the main focus, which none of the competitors are not having. Yeah, you can uh, you can concentrate on the cloud platform, provided you already have drones. When you're not in have you don't have the drones, and you're looking at the cloud platform, where you're saying you're going to complement the other uh, service providers, like exactly. uh, drones. That means you have to give the services first. Once you start making your own drones, then you can start charging for your drones and services. Uh, we are, we are, we are considering all those aspects. We are, we are looking on the different aspects of the business. Okay. Okay. So, uh, our revenue model is going to be a, a subscription model, wherein uh, pay as per use uh, depends upon the number of flight hours the the customer is going to use, and the monthly subscription cloud charges. These are value proposition. Uh, these are the pain problems which we have addressed uh, uh, from the customer point of view, right? And video, I'll show it later. Uh, this is our market analysis. Like if you see, these are the people. These are the current uh, segments which people are working on: right. disaster right. management, survey, industrial imagery, everything. But the thing is, to uh, use all these things, they are taking the drone to that particular place and then they are deploying and then they are flying it. Yeah. Now, the trend is going to change. The there is a market shift is going to happen probably in the year 2025 or 30. So the focus is going to be on visual, beyond visual line of sight. So we are equipping ourselves to be there in that particular place at that particular year. So this is a study uh, released by KPMG. And this is a market, uh, this is the market analysis, uh, wherein you could see uh, the SA, uh, sorry, TAM, SAM and SOM. So, so uh, service attainable market is going to be 84 crores. In 2024, so we we are estimated uh, to go in the market by 2024. So currently we are in the uh, concept prototyping. So we are building our product, and in 2024 we will be uh, we will be in the market. And these are our go-to-market strategies. We are mainly focusing on uh, this set of people: law enforcement uh, and uh, first responders. And then we'll be focusing on the large footprint industries, wherein uh, uh, industries like Naval Lignite Corporation require continuous monitoring the, uh, their entire plant. So we could do a private uh, uh, mobile networks. There are uh, uh, 5G networks are available. We could deploy the private networks for them alone, and they could use the drone from anywhere. I'll just show you a small video which we have done. Uh, uh, you could see uh, the operator is sitting in uh, Kuwait. We have geotagged. He is in Kuwait, and we have placed our drone in Chennai, which is in Crescent, Wonderlore. So he, he, this is the first time he is flying the drone. So we developed our mobile application and we gave it to him. So he flies the drone from Kuwait, which is there in Chennai. 
So this we have done in the last two months back. So this is our proof of concept. So we develop once we develop our application, we could fly the drone from anywhere in the world. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wish a couple of observations and maybe feedback. Sure. Right? So one thing is there are two aspects. There's the hardware aspect of the solution, yeah. which is the drone itself. Yeah, we do, we do. There is the software aspect, which is the platform that yes. you have developed. Uh, the hardware part, uh, um, like he said, there are a lot of players in the market. Who yeah, are yeah, we do understand that. If you want to differentiate yourself, then the software platform would be. Key, oh, that's what. Right. Yes. And the for the for the point that you mentioned, where you can provide services to other players, or you can use your own drones. My suggestion is that to begin on the services side of things right. sure. and focus less on the hardware because hardware <coughs> is capital intensive. Yeah, that's what we, we as of now we are not focusing on drone development. Sure. The, then the question is that you said that all these are connected via cellular networks, yes. which means that the drones to whom you will be providing the services to should also have the capabilities of integrating with your platform. Exactly. So exactly. Uh, the question for me is do other players also integrate similar technologies that allow you to connect to your platform? Uh, as of now, no, right. but there are people who are working on uh, cloud connected drones, okay. so that can be integrated. Okay. So, so um, when when you when you go out in the market, it becomes necessary to see if your customer is actually equipped to to integrate with your platform. Yes. So that is one step that you would. Okay. Have. The second observation is you showed the market slide. Can you just go back to that? I just want you to reconfirm those numbers because oh, okay. uh, a ten million SOM seems very small to be honest, right? Eighty four crores. I think the drone market is much much bigger, okay. unless. You are looking at some very specific niche in the drone market. I think the drone market should be a lot bigger than 84. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We understand right? that. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, but this is the showing is the services, uh, services of, uh, obtainable market. He's not talking of the drone, the services of the drone. So he's talking about the software, not the hardware. Are you are you saying that uh, services what the drones do? Uh, as or a platform, are you talking as a about the hardware? No, as a platform alone. The platform is it. No, no, no. And this is released by KPMG, not we derived it. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So maybe, maybe with the software, maybe it might be that number, but okay. yeah. Uh, okay. We know it is obviously much larger. Yeah. Right. So, so that's uh, the second thing. The third okay. thing is, while you mentioned all these sectors with with uh, with uh, the police and with navy yeah. and so on and so forth. Selling software to the government is not an easy no, thing, we don't right? Yes, because yes. recurring, see, in general, our observation largely has been that selling SaaS in India itself is difficult because True. we don't have the mindset to pay on a month-on-month -month basis or a year-on-year mm -hmm. -year basis. That's okay. difficult to get money from customers. Right. Even more so, what we've observed is going giving software to uh, you know the government, right? So uh, I think that is one thing that you should explore more and see. That's how what best we are focusing can. on: large footprint industries. Sorry, large. Large footprint industries. Okay. Like, so like, they can be all, like uh, Navy Lake Night Corporation. Okay. Their area is very large. Okay. They need to have a constant monitoring of their places. Hmm. So there we can set up a private network, private network for them. Over the network, we can set up our drones, and they can fly anytime. Whenever they require monitoring, they can fly it. No okay. operators required. And I forgot to tell you one thing. For this one to operate, you don't require an operator. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they can use their drones at any time they want to monitor. Okay. So exactly. this kind of industries we are focusing on, Got apart it. from the government. But just you should uh, okay. So so the private is a little more open to doing recurring revenue, recurring payments. Yes. But the government might be a little difficult. So that is one thing that you can also look at and uh, reconsider. Um, the last point that I want to make, I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of time, sure, no, but, no, but sure. the last Welcome. point that, that I want to make is uh, when you look at, uh, when you put up a slide, uh, one of the things that you should, you can focus on is to say these disaster management, the police and so on and so forth. How often are these services required? Okay. Right. So that gives you an understanding of sizing the market yourself rather okay. than relying on data. Okay. For example, if you say the Tamil Nadu police deploys drones 10 times a day, okay. right? which means that over the course of a year, how many times will they deploy Correct. and how much revenue can you make with each deployment gives okay. you the annual market size. Uh, yeah, we are also trying to get that, but yeah. that 
the difficulty is it as is of now police are not using drones right. only they are started using now right in future it is going to increase correct as of now the government purchased only three drones mm-hmm. one is in marina beach the other two is in some place i am i am not sure about it right. they have just started using it but for them it is it is going to be it is a big uh, problem for them maintaining flying the drone and all right. so they are not into drone as of now okay but definitely in future they need drones mm-hmm. and ra- for that market only we are focusing on when you when you when you pitch to investors it's important to communicate that this is a growing market and yeah. people are seeing interest like like yeah. the police yeah. are seeing interest in these sort of things yes. that aspect it is important to communicate because the current market is very small sure so yes. uh, investors want to want to uh, are willing to take risks in growing markets and they should be growing quickly okay right so so it's important to communicate that urgency of the solution sure while you uh, while you put out your slides sure. so those are just a couple of points that i had in mind sure thank you so much that's right no, no more questions okay thank you so much thank you thank you good afternoon all um we are team aerotrix and uh, we come from a state that has seen two floods in a consecutive year we are from kerala and over the floods that has changed a lot of our uh, outlook on how we treat climate everything but one key aspect that no one expected to show up during those times where how our fishing community became a guardian angel for our state and um so here we are today here before you to put forth um a company that's our idea that's aerotrix and uh, our team members are i myself is daisy christy we have ashin k sunny and uh, vishal h so recently we came across an article that was published by kerala's marine fishery statistics which said 327 fishermen have died in uh, accidents over the past 5 years and from 2017 now we are in 2022 we can only imagine how the number has changed so from seeing them as a guardian angel and not being able to protect them in their livelihood is something that we take of grave concern so this has uh, led us to think what are the solutions as engineers as students who t- write technology what can we propose to help better the lives of fishermen so uh, when we looked into this problems uh, we saw a couple of reasons one was uh, these fishermen though they are from the poor background uh, they have no adequate use of uh, safety gears the life jackets and all so most of them are uneducated or their operators cannot afford a life jacket or maybe it's com- uncomfortable for them to use uh, so they are not wearing proper life jacket they go out into the sea and if something happens to them they solely have to rely on somebody's help there comes our coast guard and search and rescue of personnel but imagine a situation that's dark out there it's night usually they go early in the morning or if the sea is rough it becomes difficult for the coast guard to reach out and help them or save them in proper time so in these cases we we really struggle to help a uh, protect our fishermen so uh, we have proposed a solution that um, employs a sensor on the boat which produces a distress signal uh, to the nearest coast guard center so we have de- we are trying to develop a drone an underwater automated system that can deploy as soon as the signal is received to the station to the site where the distress is uh, created and deploy a safety raft for the fishermen so through this we aim to increase the time that the fishermen can survive until the coast guard can reach them and rescue them any proposition currently this technology is not available anywhere we are the first team or group to develop an idea and formulate it to uh, to develop this so here uh, the time taken to to save them is comparatively less and much cost effic- cost effective whereas uh, if for example uh, if a boat uh, crashes or goes under the ocean 
uh, it may take couple of hours to know that they, the boat has crashed so it may take uh, maybe an hour to reach there uh, it may take uh, 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 helicopters to reach there so navy may might be included so it is a tedious task for them also uh, our main uh, customers are coast guards navy and fishing villages where they can uh, uh, can fund maybe gather some fund and could buy these technologies which can help them uh, on their journey our competitors are fifish pro mainly fifish pro but uh, fifish pro only uh, are able to search and rescue after a disaster has occurred whereas they they can recover the body of a person uh, from by the attaching to their arms or limbs and they uh, bring their bodies whereas we rescue them as soon as possible once the distress signal has approached us the, the drones will be uh, deployed and as soon as uh, possible we will be able to save these fishing men so um, this was uh, what our idea was okay and um, so in the market as we have said there is um, very little progress has that has occurred or if i may say none uh, in this technology and uh, this is an idea that we have to take further uh, for the on study on the market that has to be done and uh, here we are placing it for your consideration thank you lovely you want to go first or should i so guys uh, you said this is more on the idea stage right yeah. yes sir have you actually found out because yours is you said that once the distress signal has been received by the coast guard yeah. then you're going to deploy the drone okay yeah. with a raft yeah have you people thought about how heavy is the drone going to be to take a raft and go if because you do not know how many men are there on, sir, on a fishing vessel yeah. it could be one it could be 10 yeah so have you thought about it how and how long is it going to take from the shore to go down over there how long is the drone uh, drone going to take in choppy seas so um so the raft that we are proposing is probably inflatable rafts mm. so it can be packaged inside the drone and also um we are proposing an underwater travel to the distress site mm. so that means uh, we don't have to deal with much of the waves that rock the boats and all so that will be more of a stable uh, run so that we can reach faster just to give you an example i've been in the merchant navy for 7 years so i understand what you're trying to do please understand as the sea is choppy okay your underwater current is even heavy is more even more he- heavier all right it's not going to be that easy and rafts what you're talk- talking where you can drag the raft underwater and bring it up the rafts is the moment you tug it the rafts open so you have to get in, you have to think about an idea as to how you're going to get the rafts in. and the rafts are really heavy the rafts cannot weigh anything less than even a, a, i mean 10 to 15 kilos or even a 20 kilo raft yes. sometimes it's heavier okay. so this is something that you people have to work in you have to find out how quick does this go because your solution is i'm giving instant uh, solution yeah. to rescue them when you talk about instant solution it's something provided then and there yeah. because you do not know what is choppiness you do not know what is the distress that the fisherman is going through you do not know anything you are trying to provide a solution i think you people have to work around this to see exactly what is feasibility and what is the distance yeah are you going to cover what uh, a 10 a 10 mile into the ocean or are you going to cover a 20 mile because you have these fishing trawlers which goes in even on a 50 mile yes so what's the time taken yeah sure. because once they have a distress you always have a copter going in the copter flies faster and uh, they just throw the life buoy so that at least then these people are floating on water yeah so maybe you have to think about all that is is uh, required into these areas sure. to see whether it, is it a viable option yes sir okay but it's a need of the others thanks thank you so one uh, other suggestion that i had was that uh, a lot of what you're telling is very anecdotal mm-hmm. right uh again when you're pitching to investors i would suggest that you have a lot more data that goes in, right to say how many such incidents happen on a regular basis why uh, how many people are actually suffering because such a solution is not available today 
right? And some amount of data will give a lot more confidence to the investor saying that this is a solution that is really necessary. Anecdotally, I can understand that yes, this is this is important. But but for an investor to actually come in and put money into this and see the company grow, revenues grow, there needs to be a lot more evidence on how big the problem is, right? So that is also something that you can think of. Anecdotal stories are great, right? I think it, it gives a lot of value to the presentation, but that itself is not sufficient. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. I'm here to talk about my idea, basically it's a predictive analytics idea. You are familiar that the aeroplane has more than a million parts and even if some of the parts fail in a turbofan or any important uh, component of the engine, the engine will go down and the plane has to be uh, for service. And this downtime is a maximum and this downtime causes the maximum loss of revenue for an airline. So they always try to improve the airline's uptime as much as possible. That is what we are targeting. So how we are proceeding is that uh, we have already various data collected by NASA themselves for the turbo fans. So basically we will collect the similar historical data about the various components in a uh, plane, let's say Airbus plane or South, South, Southern, uh, South Airlines or your uh, Boeing and based on the data we will predict uh, how, uh, what is the uh, expected time within which the part will fail. For example, NASA they have turbo fan and they have data for almost 10 to 20 years. So we will monitor how long it is going to take, the, it's called the mean time between failure and we will find out when the component is basically going to fail. Based on that, we will warn the operator, please uh, uh, service the component so that we can improve on the uptime of the uh, planes. So like this is our idea and uh, uh, okay, I already covered this. So the, our basic uh, customer segments are the airline operators themselves like Boeing, Southwest Airlines or your Airbus and uh, airline ticket booking website may also use it as ads in their uh, uh, websites and mainly we are targeting aeroplane engine manufacturers because Jeppesen or your uh, Praktor and Whitney they are supplying most of the components of engines and they are uh, home made also. So in such a case how to give feedback to the engine manufacturers that such a part is failing very frequently so you could change the design etc. This is one more thing we are targeting. And uh, uh, these are the, uh, this is your uh, value proposition uh, canvas and the main gains we are uh, uh, targeting are the predictive analysis of the various parts failing. We are very focused actually, Airbus has a software called Sky, Skywise but it's, uh, it, it covers a lot of huge uh, broad area. So, but we are focusing only on predictive analysis in our software and the uh, pain points are actually like the low operational performance of the various systems and failure of aircraft parts frequently leading to downtime of the planes and then the revenue loss, corresponding revenue loss from the downtime. So all these are the pains and so how we are handling these pains are actually we are improving the operational performance by predicting beforehand how this, how your uh, aircraft component is going to fail and by doing that we are improving the efficiency as well as the economy of operations of the aircraft. So these are the various customer segments we are looking at. So our customer segment is basically airline operators and there is a three way market segmentation. So we have an aircraft, airline operation and passenger experience. So all three of the, our market segmentation we are trying to improve the, uh, our, their uh, operational value. And our idea is still in the ideation stage. Actually we have prototyped the idea but this was currently only for the NASA turbo fund. Actually I did this project with my uh, team, uh, my final year project students in SRM and uh, he, it, it worked well and their paper also got accepted in a good journal. But uh, we have to adapt that software with its AI and uh, various other machine learning algorithms to all the data available in our other components of this airplane also. And mainly our competitors like I mentioned are Airbus Skywise but they, they are into a lot of pies not just your uh, prediction. And one more thing we are trying to do is instead of doing predictive analytics we can also improve to prescriptive analytics. Predictive analytics what it says is this common is going to fail such and such a time. Prescriptive analysis will say if it, if it fails what to do next. So it is prescribed to the airline what can be done to resolve the issue. So that was, that's one uh, component which is not present in the Airbus uh, Skywise. So and uh, our, we are using latest AI algorithms in our uh, product. This is one of the differentiation factor. Another is that we are trying to improve the uh, our prediction uh, accuracy by more than 20% when compared to Skywise from Airbus. And this is the market segment. Uh, it is expected to grow heavily. 
and uh, our key partners are the joint research partners on data analytics, travel agents and then engine manufacturing companies. So, these are our uh, key partners. And our revenue model is basically licensing of software. So, that once we license the software, they can build on it and but there will be an, uh, a copyright agreement saying you do not mess with the, you do not, uh, I mean you do not uh, re-engineer the software but use it for licensing. Similarly, sales of software to airlines and aircraft. Uh, these are the two ways we are trying to obtain revenue and this is the roadmap for our software. So, we are expecting to develop the software within 6 months, prototype and then MVP testing within 1 year and finally revenue generation by the end of 2 years. That is it sir. Thank you. You want to start off? Yeah. So, uh, just a few clarifications also when you say uh, the turbofan in NASA aircrafts do they collect data from different airlines and different engine manufacturers as well. So, Pratt and Whitney might be giving engines, Rolls Royce engines so on and so forth. Are all these private data essentially private data available with, with NASA and have they published all this? Uh, I think NASA has done mostly with its own aircraft and its uh, uh, helicopters and its uh, rocket engines also mainly rocket engines. So, based on that they have done, okay. but it can be extended since the predictive analysis is done by various algorithms like SG boost etc. It can be applied for other uh, components also that will work, it has been proven to work in uh, and it is actually part of a Kaggle contest also. So, and people have posted their code and it has worked very well. So, it can be ported to other uh, uh, aircraft, other aircrafts or other uh, engines uh, with minimal change. Um, the other point that I wanted to put across is to say that when you when you actually uh, when you actually have big players like Airbus and Boeing, these are systems that they usually try to build for themselves internally because they have better understanding of their own products, right? So there is always a question in big organizations as to whether this is a build versus buy problem. That's what they call it, right? Whether should I build the solution myself? or should I buy it from someone else, right? So, in these sort of situations, there might be, because the engine is something very uh, proprietary to them and that they understand best, there is a there is a tendency for them to build these things themselves, right, than buy it from somewhere else. Um, maybe some a little more work on understanding how open are they to buying these sort of products. You can, you not necessarily for this solution, but you can see for other similar products in the aircraft, how often do they buy from someone else than actually build something themselves? That would give you an understanding of who your customer base would be. Do you actually sell it to the engine manufacturers or do you sell it to airlines or do you sell it to someone else, right? So, who actually pays for this is super important to uh, understand. Um, the, uh, so, tied to this is what Airbus does with Skywide, right? So, they have a holistic platform which means now Airbus is, is a manufacturer of aircrafts, right? So, um, which means that if Airbus is selling their aircrafts to let's say uh, any particular airline like Delta or Southwest or Air France or anyone, it's very likely that along with the aircraft, the software also goes along with it, right? So, uh, an Air France would be more uh, inclined to use Airbus's software because it is like you said, it covers a lot of things. And, and hence, you know, they might be reluctant to buy something from an external third party as well, right? So, these are aspects I think you, you, if, you, uh, if you can spend a little more time and understand the market and who pays for these sort of solutions, it, it will be uh, useful for you to design the product and build the product accordingly for a particular customer. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and just to add to what he said, this is very important because this is something you require a real-time tracking for you to know whether a component is wearing out or you have to replace a component because you set a predictive analysis. You, uh, that is your uh, differentiator because it not only really says the component is worn out, but you also say when when to replace it, right, and where to get it from. Now, this is this is what you have shown the differentiation between you and the competitor. So I agree to what he said because it's very uh, very important for you to understand whether there is a market for what you're doing. Yes. Whether people are actually, because any Airbus or uh, uh, Boeing would like to have that predictive analysis within themselves. Yeah. And they have the inbuilt. Will they allow a third party coming and sitting in? Uh, so this is something which I, I feel that you have to still work on and then get back. Thank you. Thank you. 
Raghunath Sharma, I am from team Saratat Biotech. We are incubated at the IIT Madras Research Park here. So, what brings us here? Like, what is the motivation for us to even think of this adventure? Is this we are at the currently going through an honeymoon phase for the Indian space sector? You see, a lot of startups that are focusing on launching their own uh, satellites or rockets, and currently we are nearly reaching what is called the tipping point for the Indian space sector. Every year, it is predicted that in the next coming five years, the launches per year are going to reach around 80 to 85, both from the Indian government sector and also from the various private sector and upcoming startups. But what, but what is the actual tipping point? You see, the more launches you make, you end up having the more space debris. There is a statistic, interestingly, from NASA that in 2030, there is going to be more effect of space debris. You will have to maintain something called space traffic also to make sure that the satellites are in place. And whatever launches that you're talking about, it is not cost sustainable. The current scenario is that the launch is done, the satellite just roams around the debris and it's only a one-time shot. It's only one-time operation. And one large-scale geo-satellite launch vehicle as per ISRO statistics costs around 160 crores. Now, where, where are we heading with this? In the long term, this is not going to be sustainable at all. So how, how do we have the materials? Is there a technology that is already available for the futuristic technology? Let's say I want to launch a hypersonic vehicle that can go at a max speed of 8 or 9. Do the current Indian market have the materials that can meet them? Or do we have the materials that can at least make the vehicles relaunchable? The answer is yes. We are, the, uh, our aim, is, that was one of the reasons of why we started this venture. So we are, uh, the founder of our company, Dr. Ganesh Babu, he carries his experience of uh, working at ISRO on a similar work that are developing these ultra high temperature materials. And we have uh, Professor Ravi Kumar and Professor Hari Kumar from the IIT Madras who are acting as our mentors. And we have Dr. Abha Bharati, who is our co-founder and uh, that's me. I'm a final year doctoral student at IIT Madras working on ultra high temperature ceramics. So, so having given you the context of why there is a necessity, we observed that, okay, we are saying there is, there is a lot of need for improvement in materials and we are also pointing it out that the existing technology that in case if it attempts can also not meet. We have to think of an alternative technology where you can meet those needs. So we are coming out with this technology called precursor or polymer derived ceramics. I don't want to throw too much of a technical jargon, but what it says is, you can make ceramics through a liquid formulation. You can shape it, you can make it, you name the ceramic, we make the precursor. That is what our strategy is, to make ceramic processing and energy friendly. Let's say, uh, so, so why are we unique? Like what gives us the edge? This is the first Indian company which has a proper technical know-how, a well-established research methodology, encompassing more than 15 years, that, can cap that is capable to indigenize this technology and not only that, our major focus is development on non-oxide ceramics, which are currently on embargo. They are non-existent in the Indian market. India has no access to get any of those materials that which can help the space program a lot. And, and the, the, the ultimate aim is to ensure that the same things are amenable at a lower cost and lower the energy consumption. So just to give you an example, the most prominent material that people talk about in the non-oxide market is based on silicon carbide, which is very well known in the uh, ceramic sector. Conventional, using the technology that is already present in the market, you have to go to 2000 degrees centigrade, apply 200 milli megapascals of pressure, and it costs you a staggering amount of 1.5 lakh just to have a small component of 20 cross 20 centimeter. So that means, not only is the material required, but the existing technology to make it is also not sustainable. It is very energy intensive. To make this component, you, it will almost take you 18 to 20 hours. It is not energy intensive. It is not flexible. You are starting with a powder material. You can't shape it into any component you want. There is a restriction. And the most important Atmanirbhar component that we bring here is, it is on embargo. India has to depend on its own sources. And we are saying, your resources, whatever technology that you use, are not amenable in the long term. So th with that as our aim, this is our solution. You don't start with a solid material at all. You make them at a molecular level. On a lab scale, 
you generate you bring silicon atoms you bring carbon atoms you make them on a liquid like as a liquid you formulate them and then since it is like a polymer you can use it to shape it into any form you want and we have the know how we can not only stop at silicon carbide we can expand the product portfolio to any precursor you can add as many elements as you want that is, which is very difficult in the conventional and existing technology it is low energy consumption to give you an example the material that i showed in the last slide it takes 18 hours with the existing technology the same thing you can achieve it in 10 hours so we are reducing the time and we are increasing the complexity without compromise on the quality and the functionality and this is a pure make in india product all our raw materials are inside the country we source them and we make it so there is a definite uh, no compromise on the reliability of it as well so just to uh, show that all these materials that which we make they are commercially not available you will not even get them on the websites that are well known for uh, specialty materials like merck sigma which is uh, related with sigma rich you won't get any of this which can push the high temperature use for any satellite launch vehicle so just to give you a context i will bring in some application so that the there is appreciation of the technology that we are bringing on the battle tanks let's say on the nozzle and thrust if you have a coating of this material it can withstand even higher temperatures so that is one of and also in the gas turbine engines especially in the hot section of it you have these components made up of ceramic matrix composites so all these technologies require and not only that we also have their applications in the automobile and electric vehicle sector <coughs> where uh, where they are used and so uh, we are not saying that we are bringing something completely out of the blue there are already companies worldwide that are doing this so let's let's look at their market and how they are doing it like starfire systems in usa which is a very well known company for the pre ceramic precursors has an annual turnover of 7 million us dollars so if you see a cumulative turnover of such companies worldwide it is around 10.3 us dollars a billion us dollars and with a market research where we have done uh, where it is published uh, with a cagr rate of 5.5 percentage in the coming 10 years the market is really huge like 15.8 billion dollars and there is no private company in india that has this know-how and that can make such niche materials. So the customer segments, I don't want to confuse you. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of applications. We are also in the process of discovery of our exact customer segment. But right now, we are focusing on aerospace and defense as our immediate customers. And just to show that this is not just mere words. It's not something that I'm just talking. We got our technology validated from ISRO. We have supplied the first high temperature material precursor, as you can see here. 1 kg of which costs around 3 lakh INR rupees. So we have, we have submitted this to ISRO. They are currently validating the technology and we hope to get a repeat order also from them. That Not only nice. that, uh, these pre-ceramic precursors to the process of customer discovery, we found that there is a huge use even in the iron and steel industry. They are now working on, there is a lot of requirement to make high temperature labels. So our formulations can also gel with the huge market of iron and steel industry where we have developed unique formulations that can go into this high temperature labels and we are this is a joint work with a private company based out in goa so what are our strategies so we are trying to strengthen our existing strategic collaborations with organizations like isro and uh, dmrl and drdo we are doing a lot of word of mouth marketing we have an active uh, social media page we are also venturing out into podcasts so that we create awareness among the among the general public that there is someone who can do uh, such alternative technologies and uh, we are also offering proof of concepts and trial services as well. We are looking to for, uh, participate in different exhibitions also. We have a huge workshop coming up in March. So this is the revenue forecast, I will just jump through it, uh, skip through it. So this is what we have achieved so far. Uh, we have another product called Ultra Spinner which is uh, related to this technology that was delivered. We have commercialized the first set of pre-ceramic precursors that was already <clears throat> delivered to ISRO and day before yesterday we have given a precursor to CMET, Center for Materials and Electronic Technology in Kerala. We have also received 10 lakh uh, seed fund uh, from IITM IC. So what we are looking to do in the coming days or in the coming months is to upscale. Currently our in-house facility can manage only up to 5 kg <clears throat> which is not uh, long term sustainable. So we are trying to increase the uh, upscale our capabilities and also spread awareness among the general uh, audience about the availability of such a technology. 
So our idea, our motto is this, you name the ceramic, we shape the precursor and we want to make organizations like ISRO or Skyroot one day <clears throat> talk about them like the way people talk about SpaceX or NASA. They have reusable launch vehicle capability and why can't we? Thank you for your attention. question would have been, how long will it take it for you to create a twin? That's my next question. So, uh, if it's uh, if I got to answer for that also, my next question would have been, how much money or how much tech you need to require to build a twin? So, uh, it's a really complex process. That's why we did twin this year to make your problem simple. So, our solution which we provide, it's a pass to create digital twin for your physical product without code. So most of them here face a problem of coding to create a digital twin in these days. But we provide a low code platform to, for your product to be built as a digital twin. And how we do, how we monitor the data? We use sensor selection solutions framework with customized optimization. And the next thing is automatic generation of millions of twins within seconds. So uh, if you guys have created a twin, it would have been difficult for batch processing. And we provide solution for you to build millions of twins within seconds. And uh, defining our business rules with data models and there are insights out of the twins which we built here. So what's our product? Like what you what D twin provides you? Like you have to upload your 3D model into our platform and we use a sensor integrations to arrive possible insights and the mapping which we do with the sensors for the specific components. We also have a, a, a whole comp, that's a, what is it? It's a whole big mission, and we also have twins for separate components in the mission. So we can also create twin for that. Yeah. So, and what we do with the data we collect? We monitor your product, we basically in the assembly line, so we find out the missing part products, and we can help you to uh, reduce your time in the inspection process and stuff. And uh, my professor, Dr. Ruben Samson, will continue further. So what is the value that we create is uh, currently like uh, uh, why we started working on this like we are seeing like there's a uh, big need for lean everywhere. So everywhere we focus we work, uh, there's a push for lean and there are Six Sigma experts who generally work with assembly lines. Generally the major job of Six Sigma experts to uh, identify waste and eliminate waste uh, from the companies. So if we have a twin the entire process would become easy we could do it in a touch. So that is the value that we actually create for customers. The lean enablement in a manufacturing sector would become quick. So the speed is what we offer to them to assess uh, for uh, what you say like uh, reduce the defects. There is a term called cost to quality which can be reduced significantly. Uh, so that is why the cost when we bring in speed automatically you know cost is actually reduced. So the thing is that we push to the customer at a faster pace. Uh, so that actually brings value to both the parties. Uh, the manufacturer is also benefited because he is having a shortened production life cycle which means like the cost incurring should be reduced. At the same time the benefit can also be cascaded to the buyer uh, because like he could also buy the price, a uh, product at a cheaper price because uh, we are optimizing the production line. And quality assurance, so we see like everywhere the plants are moving from quality control to quality assurance. Especially in a country like India the problem that we are facing is many manufacturing industries are uh, the digital transformation is a challenge for many companies. 
So because of which quality assurance is done acting in the indirect way where you could see if you go to many manufacturing industry, you could see number of numerous Excel sheets and templates flying across which can be eliminated and a digital twin can give you a quality assurance. So our customers, so basically like OEM players, like companies like Rane would be one of the key customers for us for them like uh, they are working on a, a, a seat manufacturing uh, assembly line where the, uh, it moves from station to station where they have to put in a seat and build together. The, our team, uh, 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 this digital team can be uh, grasped by uh, OEM players in order to build value to the seat and then manufacturing vendors. There are numerous manufacturing vendors. When you say OEM players, we could uh, tap onto the entire supply chain. Uh, even a Hyundai car company can take it where they could start monitoring the product right from uh, their OEMs. So that is why manufacturing industries and our major focus would be on small scale industries because there are big enterprises which has the power uh, to spend a big deal of money there. Whereas small scale industries doesn't have the capability like in, if you go and go to ground to Coimbatore, they are capable of building an injection molding machine or any machine quickly, but they cannot create a digital twin. So if we are able to offer a service for them, we would be actually powering them to the uh, global uh, lines. So that is one of the uh, reasons like, like the tech that they have can be you know like uh, very easy for them to ingress. Even like uh, we were actually visiting the IIT research park, then we were actually visiting this ASTM center. So there they make a lot of machines. They could actually become a client to us where we could engage with them and you know, make all the process to be controlled through digital twins. So I personally have worked with AA models for process monitoring. So that itself is actually a challenging uh, for us. But if you are able to give in it and clicks, that will be easy for anybody. So a digital twin would be a value add for manufacturing industries. Uh, so the market, this is something we didn't do by ourselves. Uh, this is something we have taken from a report trust market research. And they say like uh, there is a big demand uh, for a digital twin. Uh, so like uh, that is something like we are presenting here. We have not done a very detailed market analysis to be very frank. Uh, like from uh, we were actually like more into developing a product and patenting this. That is what like uh, the tools have been we have been taught to. Uh, like from Monday only like we have been understanding what business is. So this is something to be very frank. We have taken from net and we have not conducted any uh, customer discovery cycle or we have not gone through a uh, thorough market analysis. But results from the reports indicate like there are a lot of Mark McKinsey and many market research companies are giving reports indicating like there is a push in the direction of digital twin. And we can also see indicators like many blogs uh, coming in this direction. Recently we read a blog from, I mean recently yesterday night, uh, we read a blog from Cape Gemini uh, indicating like it, uh, a digital twin can accelerate the product to the market by around 90 percentage. So that is the uh, trust that they are doing in. And personally, I also had an interaction with Cognizant team that they are also trying to develop a, a, a skill set uh, for digital twin. So recently they have uh, uh, launched a future labs, got an opportunity to interact with them. So they are also coming into this sector. So this is a growing sector is what we could address based on the limited uh, connections that we have. So our revenue model, we have not tested any of the revenue model. This is something like we are proposing it based on like because these four names is something like we I mean the fourth name is something we are very thorough but the first three name is something like we learnt uh, yesterday from Nanda Kumar sir's presentation. So there is something called subscription based model. So that is something we could uh, take it up so any organization could subscribe to the process so that they will have only 3D model that is sufficient for them. They could create, they could map the sensor. So we also give them because there is a dependency on cloud. So we also give them an optimization module where uh, the sensor, uh, uh, the number of sensors to be used can be reduced because of which the cloud pricing can come down. That's uh, something uh, we are working on. And uh, we are also uh, giving them on each component, you should be in a position to run a mathematical model. See, there are a lot of predictive uh, analytic <coughs> engineers coming with a lot of mathematical models. So generally, they come up with a frame of equation which can be deployed onto the model. So that is what, uh, that is also one area where we are working on. So basically, if you take a car tire, you don't need to put a sensor to the car tire. What we say is, you uh, uh, collect the speed of the car, you collect the uh, vibration in the car, uh, and you take, collect how many times you have brake. So with this, you are able to make a model, and if you deploy it into a tire, for which actually tire I have not done any sensor. If you deploy it to a tire, I will be in a position to monitor the tire. Uh, such a kind of a twinning is possible. So that is where we are actually working on. Uh, uh, enterprise is something like we want to co-create with companies. So these first two uh, options is generally for small scale industries is what we are talking about. Enterprises, there are bigger enterprises, uh, who are actually moving towards digital transformation. So we could collaborate with them and create a digital twin. Talking about academic, uh, it's very important because we need to build skill sets for them. Though, even though we say like it is a, a platform which requires less knowledge, but still 
uh, how to uh, uh, at a domain level to handle this uh, technology something academics have to learn only then will be it will be an enabler for us so uh, going with academics and partnering with them is also something we are looking at okay so these are our competitors uh, we, we, have, we have taken we have listed only the small competitors like people who are like us who are uh, no I mean, not like us they are a, a bit ahead of us so we have uh, only listed them so we see like they are focusing them onto a particular uh, avenues so that is what we see uh, with them uh, and then they are also most of the time they focus on an enterprise solution so that is what they are there uh, they are also bigger players cognizant is wanted to coming in tcs wanted to coming in azure is also will be moving in so there are bigger players as well we don't deny that these are the competitions which we are foreseeing and we wanted to build the model more robust even company like mathworks can compete uh, come jump into the market so we are uh, building the model so the current status is we have done a proof of concept uh, and like the proof of concept we are able to develop a proof of concept on assembly line with only one sensor so which means like the entire costing of twin is something we have reduced and then that particular framework we have applied for patent the uh, patent is in the review process and then we are prototyping stage we are looking at what are the other features which we are giving our competitors products and seeing like uh, like how to make the product robust so this is the stage we are i take an example so this is an assembly line where the product is being built completely uh -huh. on so i'm just giving a simple sensor ldr sensor is a is the simplest of simple sensor that we have uh, which actually detects uh, uh, light if, if, there, if there is light uh, it says yes if you cut off the light it gives no so an yes or no condition is there in the sensor so i put the sensor here so uh, if i put the sensor here and on the side armrest assuming it is a chair so i get the inputs like the products are in right place so as the product is being built i am able to understand that the uh, products the components are put in the right place so in this way in assembly line we will be in a position to reduce inspection and the cost of the ldr sensor will come around rupees 5 rupees like if we buy over amazon now if you are able to buy it at batch from china the cost even goes down cheaper and what would be the size of something like this right Size of the part we are talking about. Uh, uh, this component is something like I am just giving you a chair as an example, uh -huh. uh, but we can do it for any component. The same concept can be even extended to a turbine. Uh, for instance, like uh, you would have seen the BB instant uh, uh, um, vending machine. Uh, recently, like a, a similar concept is what uh, uh, Tata has done. Uh, usually, a vending machine will have a conveyor, and that is how the product has been distributed. But currently now Tata has built in a model where you open the door, you take the product. Automatically in an e-commerce platform, the count will increase. So that is what they have done. So such kind of framework is something like we could also establish. Like you know, if you talk about some simple applications, I could directly put it onto a kitchen of house, and I could build in a digital twin of a, a kitchen. Any home, uh, what is it? Uh, any interior place, uh, like uh, interior decor place, can adopt the technology very easily. Where they can put the sensors along the line, so like uh, you can build in a kitchen computing application for the house. So like, what are the components are there? Can if you wanted to make it even more uh, effective, top it up. You build an API with it, uh, connect it with a big basket. If the product goes down, automatically it will be replaced. I mean, I'm just uh, as I talk to you, what pops up to my mind. I'm just trying to. So these kind of applications are possible. I'm trying to put in very very simplest applications. Uh, where it can be done. Even uh, we can make a digital twin of a water dispenser. So when the water gets emptied, we could give, give it an alert, and you know, like we could uh, put in a water dispenser. Uh, if in hospital, like you have that uh, saline bottles, there we could bring it. I'm talking about simple places where uh, simple people can readily use it. So just they need to have a sensor with them. That's it. They need not even talk to us. Straight away, you put it in the bottle, connect it. You have the bottle design, upload it. Done. Your business is having a digital thing. You would you would be a provider of the of the platform the hardware sensor also, and and you will build the digital twin for them. Uh, currently, we are opening up only the platform, but sensors will be there in our marketplace. They could buy from the sensors. There are also like uh, uh, like I have patented five to six sensors, uh, which are actually like uh, novel sensors that is not there in the market, which is very simple. So those can also be marketed here, which they could uh, adopt. If required, it is not mandatory that they have to use our own sensors. Uh, for instance, like uh, talking about drone, uh, we are working on a filament. Uh, we have printed a 3D print filament which has sensing capability. So, if you make a drone with that particular filament, 
the entire uh, drone can be visualized. So uh, it, it can be twinned automatically. So such kind of frameworks is also something we could bring. But that is all something we have not brought in as of now because that is, uh, uh, we have not patented the tech now. We are working on it. So once our validation is done, then we'll go for that particular process. But there's a lot of futuristic things that can be done. Yeah, so my sense is that, uh, you know, what I would love to see to get an appreciation of what you're doing, yes. what you're talking about, is to bring an application to life. Yes. Yes. You spoke about ABC applications. Yes, but sir. Suppose you had that application brought to life, right? Yes, sir. Hey, here's the here's my new type of sensors I have. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Based on the this concept. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're able to create the real. I mean, space. like uh, maybe like we are not equipped with the videos as of now, but maybe like in the next pitch, probably like we will build in like our proof of concepts videos, so yeah. that you will be in a position to realize it much better. Because like we have done some videos, we are waiting for the patent review process to complete. Once they complete, we will put in the videos. Yeah, I think that would be useful. Yes, see, definitely we will work on how it. Yes. actually manifests into real life applications. Yes. Yes, Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Space Rolls Aerospace Technologies, it's the first time we are pitching. So let's be clear on what stage we are in. We are in ideation stage with a proof of concept developed with our own safety engineer, which is freelanced. So what we are developing is a new jet engine technology, basically in the axle compressors. So we incorporated on August 10, 2021. We are a one and a half year old company. And what's our vision is to be a component, self lane component manufacturing company in the field of aerospace engineering. So we are Startup India certified, MSME certified, and uh, other, other certifications, compliance is all done from our part. So this is our team, myself Nirmal, I'm the Chief Operations Officer. I completed my bachelor's as well as master's in physics from 16 to 21. Also I'm an atmospheric science aspirant. And uh, Mohamed Swasid is the CEO, founder. He's in a BTEC Aerospace Engineering from SRM IST. He is the founder of the company. He plays a major role in the R&D. It's his idea, he's the art of the company. So we have an HR manager as well. He's uh, doing the PhD in uh, human resource management and we have a patent attorney, a uh, chartered account and we have a team around 10 people right now at this point. So uh, going to the next, uh, uh, about the product and the technology, uh, he'll be taking over and explaining a little bit clear on what, what we are doing. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon everyone and uh, my name is Rashid. I am not like going into myself, no, I will get details into technology. So here to understand this technology we have to understand what is a jet engine. Basically, jet engine is like simply that will intake air, it will burn, it will uh, release hot jet that will be more energized than the intake air so that the Newton's law plays here, it will push the entire aircraft or whatever it carries. So this part like this is the turbofan part and this is the core powerhouse of a jet engine. Uh, our main objectives uh, uh, objectives are like to string this part powerhouse so that we will be more efficient and uh, this is the core of a jet engine i mean I, we can say that these are these are the sub components of a jet engine uh, this is a compressor where the air compress the air will uh, come in it will compress it will combust i mean it will get burned uh, it will uh, extract some energy from the hot gases and again through this shaft again these uh, rot i mean rotors stators rotors stators these rotors are connected with the shaft which is connected with the turbine rotors so when the hot gases uh, uh, goes out it will extract some energy from uh, from these hot gases and it will uh, helps to rotate this compressor so that it will be a cycle we can call it as like brayton cycle and this is a system. So we are talking about the compressor system. Compressor system, what it does is, it will take uh, air as the input, it will compress, and the output we are expe expecting is like pressurized air. Here, our technology, what we are going to do is, we are going to raise the pressure much more than the current technology. And this is the very basic axial compressor. For the sake of understanding, these are the rotors which rotates peripherally it will keep rotating and these are the stators which doesn't rotate so the air moves in uh, the kinetic energy will be added by the rotors 
action then uh, the air will moves through these veins so that uh, the pressure static pressure rises that is the basic axial compressor when it comes to the problem we are stating two major problems here poor power to weight ratio and low fuel efficiency uh, and it all happens due to the fact that this is the profile of the blade which we were talking about the cross section so generally when the air moves in the flow gets separated here <coughs> exactly like the flow will get separated this portion into low velocity high velocity and high pressure zones so this is the basic principle of current technology and the solution which we are suggesting is the power to weight ratio should be enhanced and the total energy of the flow should be enhanced to attain fuel efficiency this is to attain more power power to weight ratio and this is to attain uh, high fuel efficiency so here we are with the design that change the fundamental way to increase the pressure and you uh, i'm so sorry it is not so visible so i am just skipping it i mean we were talking about the profile of those blades and uh, i will show our product and this is our product i mean we change the profile the profile is like this now diamond aerofoils and uh, our product name is abmp uh, abmp means like axially opposing base merged double triangular prism devices and uh, the the concept of the product is like the rotors which we were talking about these are the cross section of the rotors the air will flow in and the high pressure and low pressure zones are aligned in this manner actually for the current technology we made it in this way so that we are solving many much more problems than we expect than we stated as well and this is our product name abmp i have mentioned it already the features of our product is an innovation process innovative process and diamond shaped aerofoil we are the first ever company in the world to introduce diamond aerofoils into gas turbine jet engine applications and uh, the benefits which we will get from by introducing these features are high fuel efficiency lesser noise and stress levels on the over the compressor blades that means compressor blades are the sub components of the axial flow compressors yeah thank you i am just handing over the business part to mr normal raj he will take over it thanks for yeah so the business what we are targeting is the aerospace industry so what we have made it as uh, we are targeting the main engine marketplace general electrics saffron saffron aerospace and cfm they hold the 60% of the market share and the leading marketplace and they all collaborated together so what they want is fuel efficient jet engines and what they need is a good technology to be increase the fuel efficiency they are they are increasing the fuel efficiency every year like one or two percentage of every year but they are doing it by coating replacing the material through different processes but technologically a fundamental technology to increase for a proper i like around maybe 6 to 11 percentage of increase it can be seen pro technology that's what i am proposing and the size of market the total engine market is uh, 61 billion usd as of 2021 and uh, general electrics have the uh, the collaborators have this 35 billion of market share and 8 billion is the compressor market share which we are targeting which we are hoping to do have a business with and the business plan is to be acting as a partnership company and the technology providers where we could uh, mutually develop the technology right from the start with a mutual agreement and competitors we have the advanced technology which is better than the conventional we are little bit ahead and uh, we are also like uh, technology influencers have, have a role to play yesterday mr mr to us we have to be ahead of the curve we have to like uh, secure it properly if if it's that good of a product and the unique selling potential is uh, we have the efficient advancement of axial compressors and the partnership advantage is that uh, we have the ipr we hold the ipr we have developed it from the scratch the provisional is with us so in efficiency terms it reduces the operation cost so durability the life ex expectancy of engines increase with the help of our technology so while the proportion to manufacturers and end users are uh, for manufacturers we can see a lesser operation and maintenance cost and it avoids overheating problems and reduction in high acoustic and vibration levels sound is a main factor there are some regulations in aerospace industry which we should abide by 
So, and for inducers, they, they obviously expect fuel efficiency and more flight, endurance time, and profit. They can increase the progress. One by fuel is the one by third total operating cost of an aircraft. So, go to market plan. We have a, uh, the strategy to implement the minimum viable product to market. The full product of axial compressor, we cannot make it right now without, without the help of other OEMs. So, we are planning to implement the MVP into market by having a mutual growth to have the uh, I mean business. So, we are planning to only have direct business approach without any channels to I mean approach the customers. Also, participation in defense expo stalls for marketing. Uh, then what we are doing revenue model, yeah. Cost structure, we are planning to have a value-based cost structure for our product. And the plan for to where we spend the, is on human resources, CFD lab facilities and prototyping. And revenue is to be generated by licensing the technology. That's what you're focused on, not uh, through component manufacturing or something. So pricing model of the product will be decided upon the fully analyzed report of the Axel Flow Compressor. So this is our timeline, uh, 15 the idea was formulated, uh, 21 we incorporated the company and 23 the validation and optimization of the technology will be going on, 24 we will have our MP, MVP and uh, testing with testing and 25 the full product will be ready for market fit. And the current status we are already incubated in Kodisha Defense Innovation <coughs> Center and Incubation Center and they are ready to help us with the manufacturing the prototype, they have all the machineries and other equipments. And proof of concept, as I said, we developed with our own engineer using the NASA Stage 67 benchmark model of axial flow compressor. We used this as a concept to develop our proof of concept. The, the I think that's it. Point of time. Uh, you you said the proprietary technology is in the, the design of the rotor fin itself, right? You say a diamond oriented design. Is that is that at a CAD level, a CFD level? Uh, have you done tests there? Where where do you see it? Yeah, it's, it's in uh, CFD level now. So if we need to test it in real, uh, there is no facilities available in South India. Only GTRE or like you know, uh, I mean some advanced research center like uh, IIT. Uh, I mean all, only all those bodies can help us doing us testing. So we can say that a 99.9 percentage of the uh, innovation happening in this industry is relied on CFD. CAD we have made it, CFD we predicted our own CFD engineer. To get it validated, we also consulted a few mentors in the industry. And they also like, uh, they wanted the product to be fully developed. They like this idea, this idea is new, but they are still stuck in the, this stage. We are, in order to move on, we need incubation support as well from IITM. We are expecting that. We are in the process of being incubated in 50 places. Yeah. And uh, one more thing is like, you know, uh, this is a completely change in the fundamentals. So um, it's like a, we should uh, we should get some support from uh, incubation so that we can get our market fit ready product ready to So Would you already have existing players out there. You have just shown us what is the change they are doing it, right? Yeah. Now, how long will the competitors take for, for them to realize that you have already done this? Okay. Is, is uh, it going to take too much of R and D for them to actually uh, come up with something very similar? Yeah, I mean, uh, for them, it will be very hard to come up with something similar. So, can you explain why? Okay. So, the thought about, uh, like, you know, see, uh, I'll tell you, the concept, real concept was, like, you know, uh, working together. We are all sitting in this room, right? We are all working, uh, if we are working in a very different task. So, I mean, interacting with each other will be a very different thing. I mean, it will be a disturbance. That's how the uh, current lighting system works inside our chair compressor. We have completely changed those concepts into a way that we are all working in the same task. So that interaction and communication, mutual presence of those blades are advantages. Mutual presence of those blades were like, you know, repulsion in the magnetic field. Now it is kind of like, like you know, it will help each other. Like, you know, mutual presence is the uh, major factor. Here we are into uh, less losses and high fuel All right, thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it will be a great advancement for our country as well as like we can be a global market leader because we have many applications. Now we are into defense. Let's see, we are targeting both market defense and commercial market. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.